Hi everyone, it's John. It's Tuesday, so I have another book review for you this week. If you've been watching my videos lately on this channel, you probably, or you may, have seen the 10 authors I haven't read yet video that I posted, oh, I guess, six or eight weeks ago. And one of the authors on there that I said that I wanted to eventually read, and maybe eventually read several works by, is a, an author by the name of George Gissing. And to sort of just put some work into making some progress on that list, I thought that um, I would pick up a, no a novel by him, and I did. And that's the novel I want to share with you today. It's uh, George Gissing's The Odd Women with uh, another very uh, apropos cover there of a, of a woman reading a, a newspaper, perhaps a, a blue stocking of, of some sort. Uh, this was the Pingu Penguin Classics version. Um, bought these in a half-price bookstore a long time ago. George Gissing, who dates from 1857 to 1903, much like George Eliot, uh, excuse me, George Meredith is yet another great prolific Victorian novelist whose available work has been sort of winnowed down by history and the, the changing tastes of readership. So over time, um, George Eliot certainly has not been. I think we have all of her novels and they're pretty much all still in print. That can't be said for all of George Gissing's novels. Uh, when asked if he could rival Dif Dickens's writing speed, he uh, proceeded to basically do so and published a novel a year for the last quarter of a century of his relatively short life. And all but a few of them are completely unknown now, except maybe when you see the rare one in print, it's usually either The Netherworld from 1889 New Grub Street from 1891, or this one that I showed you, Odd Women, from 1893. These continue to stick around on the occasional list of great books, or a syllabus of a professor who's convinced that George Gissing deserves his proper place among the likes of Dickens and Trollope and Eliot and, and Hardy. If you happen to know something about Gissing before jumping into his work, especially Odd Women, you'll find the story of the novel a little bit peculiar. Gissing was actually a pretty conservative guy, and I mean politically conservative. He was said to have a an aristocratic nature and probably the last generation of people that could be said to have an aristocratic nature without irony. He didn't have many kind words for democracy, or especially populism, which in most most of its contemporary English instantiations was centered around labor movements and, and was therefore left of center. Like a lot of young people, he was once much more sympathetic to leftist politics and used his last published novel the Private Papers of Henry Rycroft, which was published the year he died in 1903, to opine, quote, to think I once called myself a socialist, a communist, anything you like of the revolutionary kind. Not for long, to be sure, and I suspect there was always something in me that scoffed when my lips uttered such things. Knowing this, it would be sort of understandable for Gissing to write a story in which he dismisses his subjects in The Odd Women, his subjects being a group of progressively minded young women trying to protect themselves and other women from poverty, with little more than maybe dismissiveness or derision. What's really wonderful here is that he does exactly the opposite. He paints them as relatable, as poignant, as sympathetic people trying to do little more than to make their way in the world, which even he is willing to show you is a money-hungry, patriarchal world. This conservative man who openly admits to being basically 
if not, you know, one in actuality, an aristocrat in actuality by birth, certainly one by constitution. And here he is showing us a picture of these women and giving us a story of relatable, sympathetic, real women without irony, without condescension, without dismissiveness. And it's actually really, really interesting and fascinating to read simply for that reason. He takes their problems and concerns seriously, and he treats them like fully fleshed out human beings, which is a lot more than you can say for Victorian male writers, even those much more self-consciously progressive and reform-minded than George Gissing was, which is to say almost everyone. Odd Women is the story of three sisters named Monica Alice and Virginia Madden, and the small group of people who make up their social circles. One of their childhood acquaintances is named Rhoda, and she's become, through life experience and also education and the socialization she has with other women in her, in her circle, pretty suspicious of men, especially suspicious of their intentions to marry women. And Rhoda now lives with a woman by the name of Mary Barfoot in a house where they've established a typing school for the betterment of unmarried young middle-class women. Of course, if you're not going to marry, you need some way to make money. Uh, that was why women of the 19th century were so invested in finding a husband, so they could find financial security for themselves, because that was just the way the domestic uh, arrangement was set up. Now we marry for love. Back then, that would have been sort of <laughs> um, looked upon as, as a luxury, which most people did not have. So Mary Barfoot and, and Rhoda have this, this house where they live together um, and run this typing school. Gissing says precious little of the sort of implied lesbian relationship that he might be hinting at by having two I used the word earlier, I think it's appropriate, blue stockings sort of uh, live together in the absence or even dismissal of men. He doesn't exactly uh, say anything to keep the reader from drawing the conclusion that their relationship might be more than platonic, certainly. Monica, one of the sisters, is really relentlessly followed by a man named Widowson. In fact, today we might even say that she was actively stalked by this guy, who is old enough to be her father, but promises her really all the bromides and the platitudes of a perfectly blissful domestic union if he marries her. Once he finally manipulates her into marriage, he grows more and more aggressive, more abusive, and pathologically misogynistic. At the same time, Everard, who is Mary, Barfoot's cousin, starts courting Rhoda, who, understandably, because of her suspicions about men, is sort of cold and distant toward him, at least in the beginning, and then he really sort of takes her, her distance and her coolness as more fuel for his fire, so to speak. He's even more turned on or more encouraged to pursue her because of the cool and distant reception that she gives him. Despite not thinking much about the capabilities of most women, Everard ends up genuinely, whatever that might mean, uh, falling in love with Rhoda, and against all odds, she eventually starts to return his sentiments of, of love. One day when Widowson has someone follow Monica around all day to report on her movements in a sort of comedy of errors twist, it turns out that Widowson lives in the same building as another man she was going to visit, not for any hanky-panky, but just going to see, 
uh, which causes a chain of misunderstandings and sort of bungled identities. One more little plot twist that, and I'm not giving away anything important here, Monica end of, end, uh, eventually ends up pregnant by her husband, Widowson, uh, which allows Gissing to tie up some loose ends about uh, the characters towards the end of the novel. Almost everything about the two major romantic entanglements here, we have Rhoda and 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 her uh, interest, I guess, Everard, who doesn't end up being her husband, and and the other one with with Widowson, um, they're sort of cringy as you watch them unfold. Monica and Monica is, is really young. She's naive, maybe a little too young and optimistic to to have taken to heart the opinions of Rhoda, who's already cynical, of course. But from a mile away, you can spot Widowson as a predator on the prowl for a wife. You can just sort of see what he's going to turn into before he turns into it. But his persistence just breaks her spirit until she until she finally relents and says yes to marriage. I had a lot of hope invested in Rhoda and her ability to resist and stay true to her mission of helping young women with Mary. But um, even though I knew her caving in to Everard was probably an inevitability, you can almost feel the the pathos which with <laughs> uh, with which uh, Gissing writes about these women and he certainly makes it clear that uh, Victorian society has given women as I kind of hinted at earlier especially on married women the short end of the stick considering I was ready to have marriage and love sort of mansplained to me by Gissing this long dead white Victorian guy uh, for the sole reason of checking Gissing off of my long to read list of writers. I was really happy to, to read this. Um, Gissing explicitly says that his books are pretty much all about not having enough money. Again, an unusual topic for a self-described aristocratic man. Again, not an aristocrat by birth, but by nature, and the son of a middle-class pharmacist who would himself grow more politically conservative throughout his life. And it was really refreshing to read about women and the problem of marriage, both being in it and not being in it, being taken seriously in an age when brusque contempt was more frequently the attitude shown towards women's circumstances back then. So, uh, an interesting first venture into George Gissing. Um, I look forward to reading the only other Gissing novel I think I have, which is the one I showed you in the video I referenced earlier, which is called New Grub Street, which is about uh, writers in London, I believe, living a sort of uh, precarious existence, eking out a living uh, writing. It's a little bit longer than this one, and um, I will uh, certainly get back to you, as I do with every single book that I read and post a review on this channel. If you know of Gissing, or have read anything by him, or have any opinions about his writing, or him as a person, have you read a biography of him, for example, uh, let me know in the comment section. Uh, I would be more than happy to uh, get back to you. George Gissing. His novel, The Odd Women, from 1893. I will talk to everyone next Tuesday. Bye, guys.